Okay, so we've talked a lot about hydroxyurea, about ruxolitinib, um, but interferon's still out there. So, Jamil, in which patients would you even consider interferon, and is there any data to support its use over hydroxyurea? Yeah, I, I would consider interferon for uh, uh, people who are interested in having children, ch uh, women, men, childbearing age, obviously. So, um, the data on interferon comes from uh, two sources. There's the uh, MPN Research Consortium trial, which I know uh, Ruben's going to talk about. And then there's the Proud PV, which is a um, multi center randomized phase three study looking at throw pig interferon, which is a monopegulated interferon, a cleaner version essentially. And they randomized patients who had uh, uh, PV to uh, either the uh, raw pig interferon or hydroxyurea. Now they allowed patients uh, who had PV to have been treated with up to three years of hydroxyurea. So those weren't necessarily treatment naive. But then the primary endpoint was to look at uh, complete hematological response at 12 months. And uh, the definition of that was absence of splenomegaly, uh, freedom from phlebotomy for at least three months, and normalization of the counts. Now, interestingly, uh, at the 12 months mark, there was really no difference. And this was a non-inferiority trial, so there was no difference between the two agents. But the 24 months uh, uh, follow-up data seem to suggest that perhaps responses are a little bit more robust in the interferon, and particularly when it comes to molecular responses. So I think the word is still out on whether it's the compound itself as opposed to Pegasus, and I guess we'll hear more from Rubin about the next trial. Ruben? So the, the second study is with the pegylated interferon alpha-2A, uh, developed by, by Roche and Genentech, so slightly different formulation than the ROPEG, which Jamil had mentioned with the other study. But this was through the MPN Research Consortium, uh, of which Rami is a fellow member, and that is an NCI-supported PO1 grant that supports this small cooperative group uh, doing these studies. And many of us, Mary Francis and others, were involved with the development and the conduct of this study. And, and what this study demonstrated, I think most clearly, was that at a year for high-risk patients, hydroxyurea and pegylated interferon were equivalent. There, there's a subtlety between the two uh, drugs in terms of uh, side effects and response, but they clearly both were efficacious as a frontline for helping to decrease that risk of thrombosis or bleeding, uh, and they clearly both had an impact on, on symptoms, although some variability, uh, some toxicities that were a bit more on the interferon side, such as uh, fatigue or flu-like symptoms and some others uh, on the hydroxyurea side. Now the study had limitations in terms of power and duration uh, length of therapy due to a variety of implications in terms of access to the drug and other things. So what we're not able to answer is at five years, at 10 years, is interferon a better therapy? It may well be uh, in terms of a better longer term control of the disease over hydroxyurea, although this study by those limitations isn't able to answer that. So where I'd say the discussion I have with patients currently is around that initial site of reductive therapy. I think these two studies do support that interferon is a reasonable alternative for hydroxyurea as your frontline therapy. Younger patients, uh, women of childbearing potential, uh, people at uh, higher risk of skin cancers, and any number of, of things, but I think it's a, a, a solid frontline uh, consideration. And before these trials, um, there, was, uh, there were experiences, phase two studies, showing that you can actually have molecular response decrease in the uh, JAK2 allele burden. So, Mary Francis, is, is this something important? Should we be monitoring uh, JAK2 allele burdens with interferon, uh, with ruxolitinib, and has it translated into any important endpoints? Not yet. <laughs> Um, I don't think we know whether it's important. I mean, that really, the more the, then you get to is the JAK2 mutation, the primary event, and that's uh, another full discussion. Um, but certainly, in the uh, the French interferon trials, some of them had m major decreases in the JAK2 burden. Proud PV starts to show um, a decrease in the a small decrease in the JAK2 burden, and we really and in some of the French patients they were able to come off treatment, although it was a, a phase two and there was no control group. Um, so that may be important, but we, we really don't know. Again, conceptually, if you're thinking what you want to do 
to cure the disease? Is, get, is, is it not that getting rid of the mutant clone would make sense? Uh, most labs don't have enough for routine monitoring yet and you, know, you get into quite a lot of how often and so forth should you monitor it and I don't think you're going to change treatment on the, on the basis of the, uh, the allele burden um, but I think that may be where we want to go in the future. So outside of a research setting, I don't, it doesn't sound like anyone monitors this for guiding therapy. Okay. I, I, I recommend it. I think we, we continue to look for the equivalent of a BCR able type <laughs> monitoring level and unfortunately I don't think JAK2 V617F is it. Okay. No, I think that other, other mutations can sometimes be helpful like you know the presence of other mutations whether it's in terms of disease risk assessment or sometimes maybe predicting therapy. For example, with interferon, I think there is some data, although it's like small numbers, suggesting, for example, if patients have like an IDH1 or IDH2 mutation, may not benefit from the treatment. But, you know, as mentioned exactly, like I don't think we monitor this uh, on a regular basis in the clinic. 